Here in chapter three, you'll learn about time structure, which is the time range. The time range tells you whether the train is gaining strength or losing strength. There are actually two applications here. One is for trending markets and the other one is for non-trending markets. A time range is the distance from a pivot high or low to the bar that breaks through it. And we use time ranges for comparison reasons only. Let's say you have a measured move going up. B obviously gets taken out by this move from C to D. Whenever a pivot high or low gets exceeded by just one tick, a time range would get created. And a time range is simply the distance from a pivot high, in this case, to the bar that breaks above it. You can count that as the number of bars in between, the number of minutes or hours or days. It doesn't matter. That's how wide that time range really is. Now suppose you have a, another measured move back to back. Now you can analyze another time range. This of course is the time range associated with this pivot that got broken. So what you're doing here is comparing time ranges. Let's call that one T1 and that one T2. Of course T2 is associated with this pivot, T1 associated with this one which we called B earlier. When you're comparing time ranges in a back-to-back -back measured move scenario, you have time ranges in a series. The question that needs to be answered is which time range is wider? In this scenario, T1 is wider. And here, T2 is wider. With T2 wider, once price action breaks above and confirms T2, then there's a good chance the energy in the direction of the trend, in this case up, should continue. If T1 was wider and T2 was narrower, then the move following the making of T2 may be limited. Let's see why. The reason as to why comes from the theory of the dominant measured move. What that is, is simply a measure move that is drawn around the widest time range. In other words, if T2 were to be wider than T1, and in this case it is, here is the dominant measure move redrawn. Again, we're drawing the dominant measure move to include only the widest time range, and we're going to ignore the narrower one. As in all measured moves, the dominant measure move follows the same rules. In other words, where is the retracement, how deep, how shallow. In this case, the BC looks very shallow. Again, we're ignoring T1. We're ignoring the pivots that are associated with T1. With that in mind, C to D move ought to equal, at least equal to A to B. This is why when you have a C D move that is associated with a more recent time range that is the wider one in a series, then you have a tendency to see the move continuing in that trend direction. 
let's say you have a time range series like this where the first one in a, in a series is wider now if you were to redraw the dominant measure move over this structure it would look like this and with this particular type of layout you can see that the CD move is already way beyond the AB move in other words C to D has been overstretched overbought and on top of that it did not go up straight it went up with a little measure move so what that tells you is that once you break above a narrower time range everything else being the same which is right about here then the end is near you may be coming to an end of a move so the dominant measure move is a measured move imposed on a series of measure moves using only the widest time range so we pick out the widest time range in a series and simply draw one measure move over the entire formation and that tells us whether the CD move has underperformed or overperformed in other words if C to D is still less than A to B that implies that there should be still move to come if the CD move as in this case that you're seeing right here is already way over stretched because of the way we redraw the dominant measure move then we might be in over so territory up at D and this is when the second time range here is narrower than the first time range here let's look at a bearish scenario there's your first dominant measure move and we look at the first time range and we can pre-calculate that while waiting for the second time range to form and there's your second time range from there to there if the first time range was to show up as wider the dominant measure move would look like this and therefore this series is somewhat oversold right around here and by the way the retracement because we're using this leg versus this leg at C the BC retracement against AB is somewhat deep compared to this other scenario which I'll show you right now here the time range is wider so now we have to redraw the dominant measure move around this series of pivots now CD seems to be not as long as AB so for CD to be fully stretched out to where it is at least equal to AB could bring us somewhere down here so therefore again the widest time range which is confirmation point one tick below B right here this tells us that hey we're going down a little bit more than compared to the other scenario and also in this case the BC is a much more shallower retracement against AB so as time ranges get wider and wider the trend is expected to continue based on the theory behind the measured move again time ranges are derived from the measured move theory directly it is the measured moves theory that CD ought to stretch out to where it is equal to AB along with the shallow and deep retracement scenario which will show you how a market will either continue on running 
or will be coming into some sort of resistance or support depending on if the time ranges in a series get wider and wider or narrower and narrower. Now here is the June gold chart, the weekly chart. Let's take a look at how time range may allow us to determine whether the trend will continue up or not. Here we see one time range. Let's take a look at that one and the one following it right around here. We'll call that T1 and T2. Here you can see that T2 is wider than T1. What that means is price action will continue on going higher after T2 has been confirmed right around here. And the reason is due to the dominant measured move. And let's redraw that dominant measured move. We know that this is the BC leg of this dominant measured move. But where's point A? Is point A here? Here? Maybe here? Since T2 is not just wider than T1, but also wider than this time range, and this one, and somewhat wider than this one, let us use this pivot low as point A. So here's the AB leg. Well, how high up should point D be? If you are just using the conservative measured move theory that says AB ought to equal to CD. In other words, the CD leg should stretch out to just the same distance as A to B. We can see how far point D ought to get. Point A back in July was 422.2. Point B, 585 even. Point C, 540.20. The difference between A and B, 162.8. Add that difference to C, which is 540.2, and point D ought to be 703 even. This is the mathematical calculation of where point D ought to be if C, D were to stretch itself out to equal to A, B. Actual high at D came in at 728 even. So we've actually gone beyond 702. This is the breakout strategy using the wider time range. Let's take a close look at where the actual entry would be and why that would be a good entry. Let's take a close look at how price action behaved around these two time ranges. First, we can see that the move, of course, forms a little ABCD. That's how all markets move. This is just a little measured move. This is not to take anything away from the dominant measured move that we've just drawn. This is just to see how price action worked from pivot to pivot. Here we can see that price action has come off of little a and has come up pretty much bar to bar straight up to b. Actually there's an inside bar right here. But on its way down from b it made a complex price range. In other words it did not come down from b down to this little c straight. Okay, because C is the pivot low that we've broken from to form this wider time range in comparison to this one. So it has struggled its way down. It did not go down very, very straight. It worked its way up and down, down and up. Now here's an important thing. While that's happening, the time range, the potential time range has gotten wider and wider. And if and when price action suddenly starts moving up from C 
to break through. Now again, the breakthrough and confirmation point of the second time range is of course right here, one tick above little b. Right around here, price needs to come off of little c pretty strong. Price action needs to break through to confirm the wider time range with strength, which means bar to bar. We don't want to see price action going from C with a lot of pivots, measure move within a measure move, to confirm this breakthrough area. That would be too weak of a move. We need to see it going up very, very strongly. So ideally, we want to see price action pull back, in this case from little b, from a wallowing, lackadaisical sort of way, while breaking through to the upside with a lot of strength. In that scenario, the confirmation of the wider time range will really cause the breakthrough to have a lot of follow through. And as you can see here, it went up bar to bar, pretty much straight up to our target. And our target was 703, and of course the actual high was a little bit higher. So this is how we trade using the wider, wider time range in a breakthrough scenario. By the way, you'll hear me say redrawn dominant measure move. And here's why. Prior to this formation actually coming into view, there already has been a dominant measure move right here. This one, suppose that was wider than this one, and that could be, then this would be the dominant measure move, which is wider than this one. So in the beginning, there was this dominant measure move to start off with. Only when this thing came around that we have to redraw the dominant measure move to shift up. So anytime you see a wider time range, a dominant measure move needs to be redrawn. Let's take a quick look at a bearish scenario. This is the August live cattle, the daily chart. Remember, the whole idea is to compare a time range to a previous one. So let's first take a look at this one right here. We want to compare that one to the next one. The next one is this one right here. Not this one. This one is an inside bar, so we're not going to use that. So here we have a narrower time range. Do not go short. Do not follow through with a downward trend direction because you may not have too much follow through. But if you were to compare this one with this one, this one's a lot wider. This one here, the second one, is much wider, and therefore a downward move is expected. Dominant measure move. Here, CD ought to stretch out to where it equals AB. Now let's continue. The next price range is here, up to here, down to here. So now, here is our time range to compare to this one. Again, the second one got wider, so a downward direction is expected. Let's redraw in that dominant measure move. Now that would be the BC range. Just how far back is the A range? Because that will determine how far down point D ought to go. If we're conservative, we'll say that one. Technically speaking, this time range is wider than this one by one bar. But let's just say we're going to use that one as our point A. In that case, point D ought to be down there somewhere, right around there. But because this one is actually wider than this one, the next one up is actually this one. This one down here is narrower than this one up here. So point A, technically speaking, should be up here. 
If that were to be the case, point D would be much lower, wouldn't it? Let's take a look. Indeed, point D is way down here. Now, you would need to write out a pivot right here. It went bar to bar. And then with one pivot, it came all the way down there. If you use the conservative point A, you would have taken profits right before this little pivot high came in. But nevertheless, this is a powerful way to trade breakouts, to trade trending markets. To, to answer the question, when a market is trending, will we still have moves left? Now, I use this personally on sometimes a one-minute chart on the E-mini Russell if I feel like scalping. I need to be in and out within three, four, five minutes. This is a very, very high percentage type of entry. You don't need to have a lot of moving parts. When you have a redrawn dominant measure move, the BC move, as in this case, will be much, much shallower than in other situations once you have a strongly trending market. So again, this is one tool that I've developed that you can definitely use in conjunction with other price analysis as we'll see. Here's the five minute chart on the Qs, the tracking stock. Let's quickly compare time ranges. Here's the first, we'll call that T1. Here's the second, we'll call that T2. Here's the third, we'll call that T3. And there's a tiny one right there, we'll call that T4. Notice how as we go from T1, T2, T3, and T4, the time ranges got narrower. That means this upward trend is very vulnerable to a downward move. Assuming price action also shows alignment that would support a downward move. There is a secondary way to use time ranges. And we'll call it sideways comparison. Now, this is different than the previous way that we've seen because we're not comparing two different time ranges in a series. Let's take a look at some examples. Here we have the chart of Microsoft. Now, this way of applying time range comparison will be used mostly for sideways-ish markets. But keep in mind that this method is not as accurate as the other one, but it does allow you to apply time ranges even when they don't come in a series. Here you see a pivot high that gets exceeded. So naturally, a time range gets created when this bar rallies above it. But the secondary way to use the time range is that whenever any pivot high or low gets exceeded, a time range would be created if you were to go sideways and backwards. So you can call this one T1 and this one T2. We use the same pivot for sideways comparison of time ranges. This one right here. So when any pivot gets broken through, you can use this method. This method will kick in. However, keep in mind that it is a secondary, more of a helper formation to support the other comparison method. Here T2 is narrower, so if we also have price alignment, then we can see that this move will be of limited scope. In other words, it won't rally too much because of the narrower T2. Let's take a look at that go chart again. Here we see the first time range as it is falling. Here. And we'll count the number of bars here. One, two, three. On the fourth bar, it breaks through. We can say that time range is four bars wide. Now let's take a look at these two pivot lows. Remember, 
this methodology that I'm sharing with you is based on the measured move and we are always paying attention to pivot highs and pivot lows. This one is 636.8 and this one is 637 even. So no time range has been formed to compare to the four bars yet. However, we can pre-calculate T1 in this situation from the standpoint that we're going to go backwards from here to here. Just as we're going forward to see which bar broke through this pivot, we will go backwards to see how many bars ago price action actually traded through this price. And in this case, it was one, two, three. So we'll call this three bars. And this one, again, we're doing sideways comparison here. This one, one, two, three, four, five. This would be five bars. Sideways comparison shows that T2 is wider, five versus three. So the breakthrough here, the confirmation point, which is this gap down bar, tells us that there should be further downward moves to come. But keep in mind one thing. From this pivot high over here, we did not break through right away. It was a measured move within a measured move, in spite of the fact that we see T2 wider than T1 using sideways comparison. This is one of the reasons why this little pivot showed up. And also, you can now compare this time range to the four bars to some degree in order to do dominant measured move. Price action really ought to go way down there. Here's the September soy meal daily chart. Let's see if we can find time ranges here. First off, there are two pivots here with the exact same high. This one will be T1. And by the way, T1 goes all the way through here because this bar also has the same high as this pivot high. We'll call this T2 and we'll call this T3. Here we see T3 narrower than T2, which is narrower than T1. So the upward move here is limited. And on our way down, we see this pivot being broken. Here T1, T2 is a tie. And then this one gets broken. There's T1 and T2, but we're coming off of a higher high here. So we're not going to really count that. Next, we're comparing time ranges in a series. Here's T1, T2. T2 much narrower. The downward move is not expected to follow through too much. Here's T1 over here, T2 over there. T2 narrower than T1. Downward move not expected to be too great. Here's the pivot high getting broken to the upside right here. But again, it's off of a lower low. So we're not going to count it. This one, T1 narrower than T2. This one is off of a lower low, but just a smidget. So this one being wider, wider here than there, causes upward move to be somewhat of a decent move. Then we compare time ranges sideways when price action breaks above this high here. So there's T1 and there's T2. That one looks like a tie. Now take a look at this pivot. T1 is here, T2 is there. T2 narrower by one bar. Now, once it breaks above this bar here, it gets interesting. Do we do T1, T2? 
or do we do T1, T2? Well, this is the one. This, in a series type of formation, takes precedence. So this is the correct way to compare. Remember, this time range analysis is originally derived from measure moves. And we're looking at back-to-back -back measure moves. So we are using the time range comparison in a series as the one that's really the driver if given a choice. That's how we do time range comparisons. The first method in a series, that's more stronger. That's the real way to use time range analysis. But the secondary way is also quite helpful in other situations as we'll talk about later, especially very sideways types of formations. So that's the time structure of the market, which is time range, and more specifically, time range comparisons. Let's look at the Bean Oil 60 minute chart and apply everything we've learned so far. For those of you who understand price patterns, this one looks like a head and shoulders. Here's the head, there's the left shoulder, and the right shoulder. The key behind a head and shoulders formation is the breaking of the neckline right here. So we can expect price action to fall after breaking through that neckline. Let's see how we can use time range comparisons in order to make this into a more higher probability head and shoulders trade. Let's start by looking at this pivot high here. When that high got broken through, T1 is formed right here and T2 is formed right here. They're both four bars wide, so that is a tie. Next, let's compare this time range to this one down here. 10 bars versus 8 bars. Hmm. Time range is getting narrower. There's even a tiny one over here, 2 bars wide. So we know that this upward move is in some sort of slowing down mode, which is very, very helpful if you're trading a head and shoulders going the other way. Head and shoulders are major reversal patterns. We came off of this high down to the slow with a huge bar in the middle. This down bar is quite long. Next, this upward move came with a lot of bars stacked upon each other. You have an outside bar here followed by an inside bar and it's just not moving up with a lot of strong energy. So you have a strong down move followed by a weak up move. From this point alone we can kind of sense that so far we can think short. We can label this A, B, and C if we anticipate a move down below B to give us a lower low because we already have a lower high at C. So breaking point B is where it's really at. This is the point of confirmation also from the head and shoulders perspective. Now let's take a look at this low. It is not really a true pivot low because you have an outside bar here. However, it is lower than this bar's low and this bar's low. So it is a semi-pivot. And when that gets broken through by this huge bar, then you can do sideways time range comparison, T1 and T2. Three bars versus four bars. It's getting a little bit wider. Since we're focusing in on this particular low, we want to go backwards and see what else we can find in terms of previous pivot lows. And what we see is that this low is exactly the same as this low. So let's do sideways time range comparisons here. T1 is 4 bars wide, T2 is 8 bars, and T3 is 9 bars. Remember, 
this pivot low is a little bit lower than this one. So we can see clearly that time ranges are getting wider as we're going down. When we trade the breaking off point B, which is where the confirmation of the head and shoulders would be, we're also trying to go and find point D because we already have lower highs, C lower than A, and right here below point B, we're going down to point D. But where is point D? Well, this was a big, strong down move. But in the process, how we would manage this trade would be to keep in mind that we may need to write out a pivot because after all, we can expect back-to-back -back measure moves since point A is the very first point of the first measure move, A being a pivot high that is higher than previous pivot highs. But in searching for point D, we're holding on to this trade. Now right here, we come across another semi-pivot high. What that means is that we can adjust our stop down to one tick above that high if we want to play it very, very conservatively. And after that, simply trail our stop loss to one tick above these bars highs. In other words, trail your stop loss, your protective buy stop loss, one tick above these bars highs. And you would get out right here as price action broke above this little bars high. That's how you would ride out the trade. And what you're doing is you're trading, holding on to a trade in search of point D or riding out a pivot low and a pivot high. In this case, it was so strong that all it did was it gave you a semi-pivot. So after that, you would want to take profits around here because around here, you would certainly have a CD range that is way, way oversold. So a little bounce may be expected. So this is how we actually use time range analysis along with measured move theories of lower highs and lower lows. In this case, C lower than A and a breakthrough. The point of no return was the breaking below B thanks to time ranges getting wider. Now we come to chapter four, which covers the Fibonacci ratios. Now there are actually two ways to apply these ratios. One is actually more accurate than the other, as you'll see. If you're not good at math, don't worry. There are excellent charting services, as you'll see, which will let you draw Fibonacci ratios by click and drag. The Fibonacci ratio, also known as the Golden Ratio, is derived from a number sequence. You add the current number to the previous number to get the next number in the series. Now this is not crucial to know in order to trade well. This is just for your information only, in case you're curious about how these numbers are derived. First, start with 0, and then 1. Now, 1 plus 0 is also 1, which is the next number. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3, and then 5, and then 8 plus 5 is 13, and so on. Now, if you take any number, especially one of the bigger ones, and divide it, by the next one in the series, you'll get 0.618, which is the root Fibonacci ratio. When we square this root ratio, we get 0.382. When we take the square root of it, we get 0.786. These three ratios are primarily used for retracements. When you take the inverse of these three ratios,
you get three more ratios. These are used for extensions. Let's practice drawing some retracement and extension levels on the E-mini S&P daily chart. Q charts allows you to draw by just clicking and dragging. There's an icon here on the left side that says retracement, but it actually draws in retracements and extensions. I'm going to just click on to that icon, bring it up to this high here, which we'll call A. I'll just click once and drag down to this low, which we'll call B. And the retracement levels are automatically calculated and drawn in for you. And here is the 38% retracement, 61%, and the 78%. The 78% is the extreme of the three retracements. In other words, if price action were to blast this way above 38% like it did here, and the 61%, the 78% seems to be the last barrier before price breaks into the extension levels. Let's take a look at those levels right now. I'm just going to pull back the chart, drag it down, and see where those levels are. Here you can see the three extension levels. Just above A is the 127% extension. Here's the 161%. And this is the extreme 261% extension level off of the AB range. Keep in mind that these are all single-sided calculations. So these three extensions are single-sided extensions. They're single-sided because they are calculated off of one range only, AB. Now again, AB can be a complex price range or a simple price range, but it is going from one pivot high to one pivot low, and we're extending up off of B. Later on, we'll talk about two-sided extensions. All retracements are single-sided, and of course these are single-sided extensions that correspond to these retracements. Q charts allows you to just show the calculation that you want. So let me get rid of everything except the 2.618 extension. So there it is by itself. This is how it looks like. If price were to rally up from down here, this would be hitting the 2.618 area and a reaction may be expected. Here is the 161% extension. Here is the 1.27 and the 78%. Let me blow it up a little bit. 61 and 38%. Let's take a quick random look at these extensions and retracements off of this chart. From this range here, which we'll call C to D. Price action dropped after hitting the 161% extension area. And if we call this A down to B, price action retraced a little bit after hitting the 61% retracement area. Let's take a look at the December corn chart. Here we see this high is slightly higher than this high. So we'll go from A to B right there. Let's draw in the Fibonacci levels. And we can see that price here went just below the 38%. But right here, we hit just about the 61%. And if we take this complex price range and call that A to B, we can draw in the Fibonacci levels and let's see what happens. 
price had a little reaction right at the 38% area. All right, let's move forward. Let's take this range right here, and we'll call that C to D. And let's apply Fibonacci ratios. And we can see that the 261% showed a reaction. This is the extreme calculation. However, there's one that is even more extreme. In a rare situation, we'll use that one. And I'll cover that a little later. But that's when it's very, very rare. And we don't want to really use that one because it might mean that the market is so strong getting down there that it might be a little dangerous. Just remember to never use just one Fibonacci number by itself. We always want to use them in combination with each other. That's the whole idea. There are three retracement levels. How would you know which one price would react to? And same with the extension levels. A measured move extension includes the retracement of the move. And I feel like they are more accurate than the single-sided extensions. Here's the Dow Jones daily chart. Let's take a look at this measured move. We'll call this A up to B and B down to C. We're going to find several levels where point D may show up. Q charts has an icon right here that says projection. This is where I click to draw in my measured move extensions. So I'm going to click onto that icon. I'm going to click once at A, drag it up to B, drag it down to C, and then click. These are the measured move extensions. 61%, 78%, here's the equal distance, 100%. 127% and the extreme measure move extension of 161%. These are the percentages of AB added to the low of C. And these calculations of course will change depending on where point C is. So let's imagine if point C were to be a little deeper, say down here. Now you can see how these calculations have all shifted down. If point C were to be a little shallower, say up here, then of course the numbers creep up. To qualify as an extension, price action needs to go above point B. So the 61% in this case barely made it as a legitimate measured move extension level. Of course if point C were to be a little deeper in retracing, then the 61% or the 78% may not qualify as a true extension. The 61% measure move extension is the smallest one. Like I said, it may or may not qualify and price action would rarely react at that level. The 78% measure move extension level is a little bit more common. This is where price action may dip a little bit. This is the area where it's par distance, where CD equals AB. A lot of people say that this is where the measured move ought to be. I think it's a little bit overrated. Price has a tendency to overshoot that. The 127% measured move extension is pretty much the bread and butter in terms of measured move extensions. I see a lot of point D's reacting at this Fibonacci measured move extension level. Here is the extreme 1.618 measured move extension off of C. Now this one means that the market is a little bit overbought here, provided other things support a drop around that area. Now remember, what we're doing here with Fibonacci measure move extension levels is trying to have an idea as to where price action may drop from, and that would be our point D. In other words, how far up above B coming off of C would price action be faced with a resistance level? And these are the several resistance levels. Here's the chart of the September wheat daily. And let's draw in the making of this measured move. 
we'll call this A down to B up to C. Now it hasn't come down to point D yet. Okay, let's draw in the measure move extensions. I'm going to click once at A, down to B, up to C. Here you see that the 61% and the 78% measure move extensions do not qualify as extensions. So clearly the first measure move extension is the 100% at 386, followed by the other two. So this market has not come down yet. If and when it does drop below B, these are the areas that price action may bounce off of. Here's another measured move. Let's click A up to B down to C. Now you can see how price action in this case hit the 100% and dropped and it almost came to the 161%. Let's draw in another measured move. Let's go from here a, B, down to C. Let's do the measure move extensions. A up to B down to C. Now this one hit the 78% right on the nose. But if we were to call A down here, then the 61% measure move extension has hit. So we can take whichever price range we want to use. They can be complex price ranges or simple price ranges. This is how we have the flexibility to use these measure move extensions. Later on in the superstructure section, we'll put everything together. Here is December cotton. Let's take a look at this measure move right here and see where this point came in at. All right, we'll go from here down to here up to here. Notice how the 127 percent extension gave us that low. It was pretty darn close. The 161 percent measure move extension gave us that low. Now let's check out this measured move right here. And we'll focus on that low again. We start from here, down to here, up to here. Again, the 127% measured move extension hit that low right near where the bottom was. Now let's analyze this measured move. We'll go from there to there. Now that's a legitimate complex price range. So here's a legitimate measured move. Let's use Fibonacci measure move extension to see where that low was. Start from here, drag it to here. Here the 100% hit right on the nose. If you remember, there were two other measure move extensions ending around that number. Now do you have some sort of idea what we're about to do in order to create a superstructure setup? Let's take a look at the March corn daily chart again. Here we see a measured move which we'll call ABCD. This formation, again, has met all of the requirements of a very good strategy number one setup. A lower than previous lows, BC retracement shallow against AB, and the CD move not bigger than AB. Here's how we catch this buy point right here using Fibonacci retracements. We take the average of 0.382 or 38.2% of the A to D move and 0.786 or 78.6% of the C to D move. Now point D is a common pivot for both calculations. Okay, let me click and drag from A up to D and we're going to use 38% of that. And there's the calculation. Now I'm going to take 
78% of C up to D. And you can see how those two lines are close to the turning point of that potential pivot bar right near the low even before it had a chance to pivot up. We can pre-calculate that area. Let's take a closer look. You can see how the actual low right here split the difference. Again, we're taking the average of those two Fibonacci retracement calculations. So that's how accurate this thing is. Let's go back earlier to this part of corn when it was going down right around here. First, we'll identify the setup measured move. Okay, 38% of the AD move right here and 78% of the CD move coming off of D. And the average of those two calculations is where that turnaround potential pivot bars high would be. So you would get in short where these two lines average out and your stop loss is one tick above the recent pivot high which is one tick above C. Let's take a closer look by opening it up and seeing how accurate that one really is. The actual high here was 214 even. Let's look at the E-mini S&P chart. This is a 30-minute chart and we're going to do strategy number one using Fibonacci ratios. Let's first identify the first measured move. And this is a very good setup because it meets the first three rules of strategy number one. Let's do the Fibonacci calculations. Remember, we're trying to catch this low here and we can pre-calculate using Fibonacci ratios as soon as this pivot got made. In other words, once you see this bar or the next bar, you can pre-calculate where this area ought to be. And it is the 38% of the AD moves to start. And I'll drag it here up to there. And the 78.6% of the C to D move. So let me do that right here. This is a C to D move. And we take the average. Let's take a closer look just to see where price came in at. The actual low came in at 1273.75. That's how accurate this method is. Now let's open this up a little bit more. This is a 30 minute chart. Let's go to the 10 minute chart just to blow it up so we can see the details. Okay, now this is the 10 minute chart. To make strategy number one work even better, we want to look at how it retraced from the first measure moves point D. Remember, down here was point C and up here was point D. And how it gets down here will determine whether it's going to be a good buy at those Fibonacci ratios or not. So let's take a closer look. We first see a move going down here and then retracing. So how deep was that retracement? Let me draw in the Fibonacci calculations and it barely got over the 38%. So this was not a very deep retracement. Then you have another measured move. This is a back-to-back -back measured move drop from point D. It dropped from here and it retraced up here before falling. And how deep was that retracement? Okay, let's check. This retracement came in a little deeper. Notice how it split the difference between the 38% and the 61% pretty much around the 50%. So this retracement here, from here retracing up to here, is actually deeper than this retracement here. 
So the following retracement in this back-to-back -back measured move scenario has gotten a little bit deeper. Now we need to compare time ranges. How is this time range compared to this one? In other words, how's T2 versus T1? They're the same, so it's a tie. So that's pretty neutral. So coming off of point D, we see that the retracement got deeper and time ranges resulted in a tie. So this is what we mean by having alignment with price and time into a pre-calculated area, which of course is this area right here that we were thinking about buying. So this strategy number one, buy at that price, makes a lot of sense. Buying down there makes sense because with retracement being deeper, that means the price action is slowing down as it drops. Now this is a tie, so that doesn't take anything away from the retracements. Ideally, we want to see time ranges getting narrower as well. All right, let's continue. As we move up from here, we can see that we made pivots. Now, what you have here is an interesting study. Time range over here compared to the one over here got narrower. So you can think, okay, we might be slowing down somewhat. Now let's apply measured move extension. We're going to go from here up to there and down to here. And notice how price action came right to that extreme 1.618 measured move extension level. Remember, you bought somewhere around here. But on this way up, you have this huge bar, which was expected. But because of the narrower time range and the extreme measure move extension, a little drop was expected, not out of the ordinary. But after it came down a little bit from here, it was getting ready to go back up. Remember, going up above here is still the goal. That's where you want to take profits. This CD move is actually the AB move off our second back-to-back -back measure move as per strategy number one. So this is actually our little A. And this is our new little B. This is, of course, little C. And when you have such a formation, the implication is that price action should go up and above B up to point D. So even though we have a little drop going down from here, which was expected thanks to Fibonacci ratios up there and narrowing time ranges like we mentioned, an upward move is also expected to resume the upward move so it can break above B. And let's take a look at what happens on its way up. It first broke above this pivot high. So let's do sideways time range comparison. So T1 and T2 are about the same. So it's a tie, somewhat neutral. But when it breaks above this high here, then this time range needs to be compared to this one. Here, T2 is wider. And so the uptrend is expected to continue. And let me stretch it out. Let's see why this move up was so strong. Let me bring it together and have a closer look. As price action rallies straight up here, it moves past B to form that time range to be compared to this one. It is a lot wider, coupled with the fact that this was, as mentioned earlier, wider than this. So you have winding time ranges on two levels. So that leads to a ferocious up move. Let's take a look at the September crude oil daily chart. Here we're going to demonstrate how strategy number one may fail if you rely only on Fibonacci ratios. Okay, here's that first measured move, A, B, C, D. So far, this measured move meets the first three rules of strategy number one. A, actually lower than 
previous lows. BC retracement shallow, less than 50%. And the CD move smaller than the AB move. Rule number four says buy at confirmation when a pivot low is made. Somewhere around here a pivot should happen and you should be buying it right around here. But suppose you want to use Fibonacci retracements to get some calculations in so you can jump the gun and get in a little bit earlier before it pivots up. So let me draw in the levels. A to D will take 38% of that and C to D will take 78% of that. So mathematically speaking right around there should be where the pivot happens. But as you can see it didn't happen. Price action never pivoted. In fact it went below C. So for those of you who want to jump the gun and use Fibonacci retracements to anticipate the actual pivot before price gets down there, you must look at how price action went down from D. This is the daily chart. Let's take a look at the 60 minute chart to open it up to see how price action actually trades down from point D. Okay, so this is a 60 minute chart of crude. And here is where we should be seeing a bounce mathematically. But what we want to do is take a close look at price action as it drops from D. And what you see is first a move down. These bars are stacked upon each other. You have this retracement right here. Let's do a quick look. We're going to use that up there. And we can see that it is not quite 61%. It is about halfway of a retracement. Price action then accelerates bar to bar with very little overlap around these bars. So it actually went below point C. On this chart there is no back-to-back -back measured move off of point D. And no narrower time ranges in which to compare. Be careful when you don't have confirmation in a smaller time interval chart.